All right, so I, I, I just got to hand it to you. Way to be in church right now. This is like on a day like today, way to make church a priority. So I just, I had to hand it to you. Thanks for, thanks for being here, and I'm, I'm glad we get to worship. I'm glad we get to jump into God's word. Before we jump into God's word, though, I got a question for you, and that is, how do you do with rules? Because, I mean, there's two types of people in here, right? We have like the rule followers, and then we have those who don't really care so much about the rules. And oftentimes what happens is uh, they marry each other, right? <laughs> Any families like that in here at all? Um, I had a bit of a flashback last week. I was invited to speak at my college's chapel, and it was really fun, and it was really cool to be back. It's funny. I hated chapel as a student, and it was so weird to be up there. But uh, I'll tell you, though, the people that in, in college, the people I never did well with were the public safety officers, you know, the guys with the plastic badges. I was just constantly getting yelled at for, for breaking some obscure, unnecessary rule. You know, it's like they had a chip on their shoulder, respect my authority. And so, so no joke, I, I mean, w- w- when I uh, showed up for my, for, to, to speak in chapel, I, I walk onto campus, and last week, the first person to greet me was public safety, and they chewed me out for breaking a rule. I hadn't been on campus for more than two minutes, so getting chewed out. I was like, oh, it's good to know things haven't changed around here. Like, we just picked up where we left off, Paul Blart. And... To be candid with you, it, it did leave a bad taste in my mouth. Right, I'm back on campus, I'm, in, I'm enjoying the old stomping grounds, and it's like, man, smacked across the face of some ridiculous rule. And not even so much like a hello, welcome, glad to have you, it's just, why aren't you following this rule? I wonder how many people don't go to church because they're expecting that to happen. Right, same thing's gonna happen. I'm gonna walk into church, they're gonna notice that there's not a ring on my finger anymore, or, or, or when they get to know me, they're going to find out that my kid is older than my marriage. I haven't been to confessional. I don't, I don't want to see the priest. I haven't been in church in how many years? You know, surely public safety is going to throw me out. I don't even know what the church dress code is. Like, what, what, if, they, what if they see me not put anything in the offering bucket? You know, I, I don't want to go back. I'm sure I'll unintentionally break one of their rules as soon as I walk into the church. There's a lot of people that, that feel that. In fact, maybe you had to get over that just to walk into here. But seriously, there's a lot of people struggle with God in general just for that very reason. In fact, even churchgoers really struggle with God for that very reason. Us. He's got a lot of rules. I mean, what he says about sex, what he says about money, what he says about how much we can drink, what he says about how we talk, he's, he's got a lot of rules. And so what happens is our response to God's rules fall on this really weird spectrum. Some of us are on one end of the spectrum, really trying to obey, right? We're very concerned about the rules. Ah, I'm a rule follower. I got to do this, 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 and this. I got to get the A+. Plus. I got to dot my I's. I got to cross my T's. I got to keep up with all these rules. There's a lot of guilt in that. In fact, a lot of religions have been built on the backs of, of these people. But then there's people over here just say, I don't really, I don't really care. I don't like the rules. Screw it. I'm going to sleep with who I want to sleep with. I'm, I'm going to talk how I want to talk. It is my life. It is my money. It is my body. And then, I think there's a lot of us in here. We're, we fall somewhere in between on this spectrum. We come in here thinking, okay, I got to follow the rules because I guess that's the deal. But like, I'm not going to freak out about it like grandma so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manage the rules. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to cross every T and dot every I and all of that, but, but I'm going to care, you know, at least a little bit. I'm just going to kind of pick and choose here. I'm going to manage these rules. I want to see how much I can get away with without being this guy over here. Most of us look at the spectrum, and I bet you could put yourself somewhere on the spectrum right here. And today, old John says, wherever you find yourself on this spectrum, it sounds really miserable. Can we just rethink our whole approach to God and rules and this whole idea? See, this could be absolutely life-changing for you if you lean into it. First John chapter five is where we find ourselves. We've been working through the book of First John and we find ourselves in chapter five. First John chapter five, we're gonna look at verses one through five together and very closely. This is one of my favorite sermons where we just kind of, we take like a little bit of text and we just really zero in on a lot of stuff here. I really encourage you to grab a Bible. We got Bibles in the chairs, page 1023 on those Bibles. Otherwise, phones, we have the Bridge app, the Bible on there, as well as notes. You can take notes on that app, which is, uh, which is nice. First John chapter five, verses one through five. 
Let me pray. We'll jump right in. God, I thank you so much for your word. May you remind us that you have something specific for us tonight. There's something that you want to say to each of us, and there's something you're going to say. I gotta pray we don't miss it. May you zero our minds in on your text, on you. May your Holy Spirit illuminate this text to us and work on our heart. And may we not be battling the Holy Spirit and, and, and pushing, um, pushing situations that he's bringing to mind. May we not push those away, but may we really lean into this tonight. May you eliminate all distractions, whether it's in the room or things that we're thinking about we gotta do tonight or tomorrow or this next week. God, may you really capture our minds and our hearts right now and focus us in on you because you are going to say something and we don't want to miss it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The parchment shakes a bit as he slides it to his left. He puts the quill back in the ink jar and, and stares at a blank canvas ready for more words. He scratches his beard trying to decide if he should take a break. See, what he's written so far, it, it doesn't feel done. Yet he's not quite sure how to really continue. He's no trained writer. John's a trained fisherman and comes from a long line of trained fishermen. Learning the discipline of sitting in solitude like this, it doesn't come naturally to him. This is something he picked up from Jesus. Jesus was so good at getting away. For hours on end, I mean, John, John remembers waking up at camp in the morning to find that Jesus had already left hours before the sunrise to go climb a hill and pray for hours. And now that he thinks about it, it's striking. Jesus had so much discipline. He was often up before the sun. He would dine with drunks, yet he never had too much to drink. Women flocked to him, yet he never slept with any of them. He had all this power, yet he continually leveraged it, never abused it, but leveraged it for others. Jesus had so much discipline. And yet, even though Jesus was extremely disciplined, he wasn't like this rule-heavy prude, freaking out about everything. On the contrary, Jesus was fun to be around. He broke a lot of unnecessary rules. So John sits in that chair thinking, what was Jesus' approach to rules? What made him so different than everyone else? And maybe it's this thought that John fills the empty parchment with. Verse one of chapter five, he writes, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. It is really easy, especially in the first verse of, every, of, of most chapters, to really kind of breeze past it. Um, but, but this is such a brilliant thought. John says, we're gonna talk about rules. I'm gonna talk about rules here for a second, but, but we're gonna start right here, relationship. I mean, notice what John points out born of him, family. This is how John starts the whole conversation. I want to talk about rules, but first I want to let you know, I want to remind you, it's a family. See, first and foremost, this is so important, this is something that so many of us miss, at least miss in our hearts, is more than rules for you, God wants a relationship with you. And that alone just blows up that whole spectrum that a lot of times we find ourselves on. That doesn't mean that God doesn't have any rules. Every relationship has rules, but this right here, this lens, this priority matters. I mean, you know this. There's a big difference between a rule-driven parent and a relationship-driven parent, isn't there? You might have had a rule-driven parent growing up, right? Lots of rules, lots of expectations, very little relationship. And so you can never really feel like you're, you're living up to their expectations. Never, not much relationship there. John writes here, he writes, that's not our dad. This is one thing that uh, Nicole has really helped me with. We got little kids, and uh, the thing about little kids is they're so messy, and they're so sticky. You know, they'll come up, and they'll, like, give you a hug, which is so sweet, but then after they run off, it's like your clothes are all, like, sticky and, and chocolatey, and the goldfish crackers. Can I just say, I hate goldfish crackers. We need to find a way to cancel goldfish crackers somehow. I, I clean Nicole's vehicle every, every few weeks, and she's very clean, but the girls in the back, different story, not so much. Like all those dang orange crumbs all over the place, those stupid, orange, those stupid goldfish crackers. Leftover sucker sticks, you know, stuck in the, the cup holder. It's just, it really cuts me deep. And, and so a few years ago, every time I would clean the car, I'd walk in the house, and the first words out of my mouth after I walked in the house was, all right, new rule, no more dang goldfish. 
New rule. No more suckers. New rule. Stop touching the glass with your grubby little fingers. Go up and help them, you know, uh, clean, their, clean their rooms. Like, new rule. Barbie shoes need to be super glued to their feet because I'm tired of trying to find its match. New rule. No more slime. New rule. New rule. New rule. And after a while, Nicole said, can you please just chill with your new rules? You have all this list of rules. First off, I don't think the girls remember all your rules. And second, you just sound like a rule happy dad. She doesn't have to clean the goldfish crackers though. But she's right. And this is how John starts the conversation. He starts it this way. We don't have a dad in the sky that's shouting, new rule, new rule, new rule, rule, rule. No, we have a dad saying, relationship. That's what I want. I want a relationship. And that makes a difference. How easily do we forget that? Some of us have been coming here for years. We've been through 101, been through small groups, maybe even lead small groups, maybe lead a ministry, been serving. We've been coming here for years. And for some reason, come on, because I'm the same way, we just default to seeing God as this keeper of the rules. And God says here, can you just stop with that? I'm a giver of relationship. See, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. And so often, parents, if you're, if you're a parent of little kids, parents, you know, we, we really want to train our kids well, right? You know, raise them to love God, raise them to be successful, raise them to be disciplined, raise them to live healthy lives. And we can think, well, that's got to be done through a lot of rules. Maybe. Or, or there's those of us who maybe run an office or maybe you run a team, you know, you, 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 you run a staff and, and we can think the same thing. Good working office is going to have this rule and this rule and this rule and this rule and this rule. Again, maybe. But without the relationship, there's no motivation to follow said rules. They're just cold, hard rules that are inviting rebellion. It's the relationship that drives obedience. The relationship drives obedience. When I was in high school, I, I was hanging out with some classmates, and uh, we attended a very, very uh, extremely strict school. And, and my buddies, uh, they came from very, very extremely strict families, lots of rules. And uh, unfortunately, in these certain buddies, um, they didn't have much of a relationship at home. So their parents were very much the keeper of the rules, but not giver of much relationship. And we were hanging out one night, and we were talking about the possibility of sneaking out and going to an Eminem concert and then a party afterwards. So not a place that we should be. And so my buddies are planning this, and, uh, and they said to me, they said, Junior, you coming? And I said, no. And I'm like, what? Come on, you actually like the rules your parents have? And I said, no, I don't like the rule, but I really like the relationship. I enjoy my parents, I have fun with them, I love laughing with them, I, I, I like that we can talk about anything. I don't want to throw that away for some 45-minute concert. I don't care about breaking the rule, but I do care about hurting the relationship. And that's John's point. That's the point that John is making as he starts this whole conversation off. Is we have a dad who is relational driven. He first and foremost is concerned about being close with you and enjoying you and you enjoying him. And that matters most. This is why Jesus lived an extremely disciplined life. Jesus, Jesus took some rules very seriously. A lot of times we like to see Jesus as some, like, some hippie who didn't really care about the rules, always you know, breaking rules. Yeah, he broke rules. But Jesus was also very, very strict. Jesus' is teaching, extremely strict. Jesus had a strict view of marriage. Jesus had a strict view of divorce. Jesus had a strict view of love. Jesus had a strict view of giving. Jesus was strict. But more than strict, he was very relational. And so people would leave his sermons, after hearing Jesus preach, they would leave his sermons going, geez, that guy is strict. But I like him. I don't like his rules, but I, I, I like Jesus. I like the relationship. See, John starts this conversation just in a brilliant way, as, as a good parent. Hey, let, 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 we're going to talk about the rules, but first, can I just remind you of the relationship? Let me remind you of the motivation to follow the rules that we're going to talk about. And we could just end with that, couldn't we? Like some of our homes, some of our leadership, some of our offices would look drastically different if we just apply this idea. Let's be relational driven. Yes, let's have, let, we have to have rules. But let's lead with the relationship. Let's focus on the relationship because without that, there's no motivation to follow some cold rules. It just invites rebellion. 
This is what John is doing. Only one verse in. We've got to continue on. He says, by this we know that we, love, that, that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. So for the last few chapters, if you've been with us, for the last few chapters, John has been repeating this theme. You're not of God if you don't love the people of God. You're not of God if you don't love the people of God. Now he's building on that. He's saying, here's how you know that you love God's people. You keep his rules. Why is that connected? John is saying that I prove that I love you by doing what God says. This kind of seems ridiculous to me. Uh, one thing that Nicole and I have been working on with our girls is uh, manners at the dinner table. Uh, and the most difficult one at our dinner table is our four-year-old. Because she's four. And if you've ever met her, she doesn't shut up. And she's fearless and she'll do anything to make her sisters laugh. I love this girl very much, but she is, she is the difficult one at the dinner table. And so the other night we were attempting to have a civilized dinner. How could we? Shame on us. When Reese stands up on her chair, breaks a rule, stands up on her chair, knocks the cup over, spills a drink on the food. Her failure to follow a rule by sitting at the table ruined much of the dinner at the table for the family. John is saying, it works like this in God's family too. Our decisions to follow the rules or not follow the rules, they don't just impact us, they hurt the others at the table as well. Whether it's a financial decision, a drinking decision, a sex decision, a failure to lead decision, a failure to parent decision, those affect the others at the table. Now we don't really like that thought because we're so individualistic. I like to think, I have my relationship with God, you have your relationship with God, so you do your thing, I'll do my thing, we'll get along and stay out of each other's business. And John would say, oh sure, sounds great in theory, problem with that is, it's just not reality. Because a decision to gossip spreads through the church, spreads around the table like a disease. It divides the table. A decision to be selfish keeps the body, keeps the table from being able to do more. It hurts the table. A decision to be negative kills the mood at the table. A decision to have a fair puts a black eye on the table, on the community. A decision to not submit hurts the rest of the table. Our decision impacts far, far, far more people than we like to think. That's one of the things in temptation. Is that, ah, this is just you. And John's saying, no, this decision isn't just about you. It's going to impact a lot of other people. I know a guy who started a ministry, and uh, he was, uh, started a ministry, he was able to hire some staff, and then he was able to hire some more staff, and then some more staff, and became this, this, quite this big organization, hundreds on staff actually, global ministry. At one of their uh, yearly picnics, the, the guy who started this ministry, his, his son had said to him, his son, he said, Dad, this is just crazy, it used to just be you in the garage, now look at all of these people here at this picnic. And I love what the dad said back, the dad said back, it's a lot of responsibility on us. Yeah, it's cool, but it's a lot of responsibility because if we screw up, let's say you drove off, you drank too much at this picnic and drove off, and tomorrow's headline in the paper was you drinking and driving. All of these families' jobs here, their livelihoods would be put into jeopardy. So those kids running around and playing that game over there, they depend on you and me to live above reproach and by the rules. Otherwise, it affects what goes on their dinner table. It's a healthy, heavy weight to live with. And John is putting that on us in verse two. First he says, hey, it's relational. He's also, but also your decisions impact everyone else. It's the same with you and with me. The decisions we make, the places we go, the words that come out of our mouths, how we handle our anger, how we do relationship, it affects the others at the table. See, John is saying here, point number one, super obvious point, but John is making it, so we gotta say it. Number one, obey God's rules. Obey God's rules. I know, this is elementary. This seems like, come on, Junior, you should be like teaching this in bridge kids right now. O-B-E-Y, obey always, right? I, and I totally get it. But, but come on, let's just look at this from a different angle then. How many of us find ourselves spending more time finding ways around the rules than actually living by them? Excusing instead of just doing. Justifying instead of actually trying. See, John is shooting straight with us. He's saying, you can't say you love God if you're more focused on finding ways around what he's saying. You just do them. So I know, like, this is one of my struggles in, in preparing the sermon. It's like, this is so obvious. This is so obvious. Why are we talking about this? Well, the answer is because we suck at it. 
In all seriousness, do you feel a healthy responsibility to God and to your church to do what's right at every turn, no matter how you feel, no matter the difficulty, to care about, to know, and to obey God's rules? See, when we don't, well, we are actually communicating to God. And Don tells us we're communicating this. For this is the, the love of God that we keep his commandments. This is a difficult translation. Essentially, what, what John is saying is he's simply saying, you want to tell God you love him, do what he says. Growing up, there's this woman in our church. Um, she had the reputation of being this gossip. I mean, she could cut you up good. She's very, very critical, especially if anything the church that would that the church did that she didn't like. She's very, very vocal and gossipy, very, very critical. Her husband was completely whipped, and uh, and, and she would just get all kinds of nasty if, if she didn't get her way. And then her husband would go do her bidding for her. It was just a very terribly unhealthy marriage, terribly unhealthy woman. But during worship, um, she would come up to the front, hands raised, and just weeping during worship. Now, I'm not saying her worship wasn't true, because I'm in, I'm in no place to, to judge that. I shouldn't even be thinking that way. But, but I will tell you, as a kid, I do remember, as a kid, in my own judgmental sin, as a kid, I remember thinking, you're so passionate about telling God you love him during the music. That's great. But why don't you show him that you love him and obey and stop being so nasty to everybody? See, we're all there at some level. We're all there. Most of us have this desire to, to love God. We, we want to tell God that we love him, which is awesome, and we should. But we don't want to do something that he's asking us to do. We'll get, we'll get really awkward here. Uh, there is something that God is asking you to do, and you've been pushing against it. Isn't there? There's something that he's leading you to. There's something that he has asked of you. There's something that he's nudging you about, and you're not doing it. I don't want to submit God. I don't want to forgive God. I don't want to serve that person. I don't want to leave my comfort zone. I don't want to give. I don't want to confess. I don't want to lead. I still love God. I just, and John would say, okay, but, but, but do you? I can't answer that. But the truth is, our, our love is proved through our actions. And I know that sounds so religious, but take it up with John because he wrote this. You think about it this way. Let's say after church. After church, I go home and uh, plop down on the couch. And tonight we're having our, our, Sabbath, our Sabbath dinner. And I don't help with dinner at all. I don't help with the cleanup. I just kind of sit there and Nicole makes dinner and Nicole puts you know, everything away and cleans up and then bathes the kids and Nicole puts the kids to bed. If at the end of the night, I hop into bed and I say, love you. Those are some cheap words, aren't they? Maybe even offensive. I, probably, I should probably get slapped for even saying that. But me serving her, taking an interest in her and learning her what she likes and what she doesn't like, like loading the dishwasher the way she wants it loaded, which makes no sense to me because if the cups fit next to the bowls, they fit. I don't understand. But if I'm learning her and I'm taking an interest in her and I'm listening to her and I'm doing what she likes, all of that makes the I love you mean so much more. In the same way, our obedience to God throughout the week gives value and weight to our raised hands in worship. It makes it all the more meaningful when we come together and we worship God after a week of obedience. Really, our week is preparing us for worship in song. Again, I'm not saying you, you can't worship unless you're perfect because none of us could worship, but our obedience gives power to how we express our love for God. John continues, and he says something interesting. Look at this. He says, and his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, God isn't some Paul Blart on campus running around trying to dock you for some unnecessary thing. His, his rules aren't lame. They're not cruel. There's a point. There's a reason. There's a benefit. Uh, see, I find it fascinating that the, um, the, the Greek root word for rule, the, the, word, the root word for rule is the word trellis. I don't know if you know what a trellis is, but I, I got a trellis right here. You know, any gardeners probably know exactly what this is, but you stick one of these in the ground in your garden. You plant some plants around them. And then ideally, the plants will, you know, they'll, they'll grow up the trellis. Without a trellis, a plant, especially if you want the plant to grow tall, a plant could easily grow sideways. 
Uh, I could easily get snaggled up, tangled up in the weeds. Uh, I could fall over and die. Like a trellis, these are a huge benefit to gardening. If you actually look at the statistics and read like gardening blogs, which I did this week only for this illustration, it's, it talks about how a trellis will make plants, on average, grow, grow much taller. Uh, they'll make plants live much longer. And if, if the plants bear fruit, a trellis will actually help plants bear way, way more fruit. So having a trellis with a plant adds way more value to that plant. This is what, this is what John is getting at. God's rules are a trellis. Now, yes, some people have taken the trellis and made it into a cage, religion. Right? This is what Jesus battled the legalists over. They had used rules to, to capture. They kind of made this trellis into a cage and, and held people captive. Kind of like observing the Sabbath. Right? We've talked about this a lot, but there are huge benefits to observing the Sabbath. Uh, data backs this up. You are far more productive. You are far more creative. You are far more efficient. There is far more health in your family if you take one day a week to rest and worship. That's a trellis. Man, that, that's a rule that really helps you grow. Now, the religious leaders during Jesus' time, they had taken the trellis and they made it into a cage. And they ran around like public safety officers, counting people's steps. And you can't, you can't walk that far on, on Sabbath. So they had made this into a cage. That's a cage. But God's rules, when viewed correctly, are a trellis. They're a huge benefit to your life. Following God's commands about what you consume, whether it's too much food, too much alcohol, it's a trellis. It, following those rules helps you physically, helps you mentally. Following God's rules about money, sex, work, it all benefits your life. It's a trellis, it's your plant, it's a trellis that helps you grow up and grow closer to God, to grow in the eyes of others. This is why King David wrote in the Psalms, I love your precepts, God. I love your rules. Who says that? Someone who sees God's commands for what they are. A trellis that helps you get better, do better, and be better. I feel like when I was 14, I got my first job. My first job was I worked at a family-owned grocery store in town, and I stocked shelves. I got, made five fifteen an hour. Then I got a big promotion to a cashier. made a whopping 10-cent raise from that. Five twenty-five an hour. I was a dangerous man with some money in my pocket. I, I, I worked a lot uh, for a 14-year-old uh, because I had no life. I really was not dangerous with money in my pocket. I, I had no life. But the paychecks were really nice, and, and especially for a 14-year-old. Problem was is my parents made some rules. They set some rules because um, they're just jerks. I had, I had to give 10% because that's what it said in the Bible. So I had to give 10%. And then um, and the other rule was I had to save 40% in, in a bank account at the bank that my mom worked at. I hated that. I didn't see 50% of my paychecks. Uh, I hated that until I turned 16. When I turned 16, I uh, found a car that I wanted to buy. It was a Plymouth Laser. If you remember these Plymouth Lasers? It was a 91 Plymouth Laser, twin turbo, burned oil, but it had flip-up lights, so that was cool. And, and I wanted this car so bad. It was a 1000 bucks though. There's no way that I was going to be able to pay that. Until my dad said, well, why don't you check the bank account? It's like, oh yeah, that stupid account that you had always had me keep putting money into. Like, and I look at the balance, it's like, oh my goodness, I have enough to buy the car. Now, suddenly, I really, really, really loved my parents' rule of saving 40%. I still appreciate that rule. It taught me how to save. So still, that rule is still helping me grow like a trellis, the, the benefits of putting money away. This is, this is why David landed where he landed. This is why John is writing what he's writing. He's just saying, man, when I look at my life, when I look at those who don't have the trellis versus me who does have the trellis, when I look at my life, man, I love your trellis. I love your rules. I love your precepts. They're in my best interest. And maybe that might be hard, but they're not burdensome when I look back on them. Number two, don't just obey the rules. Love God's rules. Love God's rules. You might be thinking, junior, you're getting lazy, man. Point number one, point number two, basically the same. No, they are not. Point number one without point number two is just bad religion. See, there's a big difference between observing a rule and leaning into a rule and understanding the rule and seeing the benefits of the rule and championing the rule and loving the rule. See, the best version of you is living inside God's rules. It is to your strength. It is to your health. It is to your advantage. It is to your success to lean in 
to his commands. It's the trellis. It's not a cage. It's there for your benefit so you can be better, stronger, healthier, and move in the right direction. Can you actually say that you love God's rules? Can you actually say that? Or do you find yourself more on the spectrum? Something I manage. Downplay, find ways around, ignore. God says, no, I don't want you to just follow them. I want you to lean into them like a trellis, and I want you to love them. John continues in in verse 4. He says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. I love this picture. This is so powerful. He says, lean into the trellis, overcome the world, grow above it. The plants in a garden that embrace the trellis end up growing above the weeds. They are taller, they are stronger, and they live longer. It's the same with us as people. A person who embraces God's trellis, God's rules, leans into everything he says, they end up growing above the weeds. And by weeds, I mean the noise and the chaos and the misery of this world. John's giving us point number three. Live above the world. Live above the world. I want you to obey God's rules, John says, but I also want you to love them. Then enjoy the ride. Embrace the trellis. Love the trellis. Grow up the trellis. Man, enjoy the ride. Enjoy the victory that comes from that. One of the rules I, we have for our kids is uh, they have to make their bed in the morning. And it's just a Ziegler family rule. It might not be a rule in your house. That's fine. I'm judging you. I just wouldn't tell you that. And so each morning, the, my girls, they have to make their beds. And, and they have to make it good. They can't just do it sloppy. They have to make it good. And the reason is, is I'm a big believer in the idea that how we start our day snowballs. Now, you found this to be true, I'm sure. So if, like, you get up in the morning, you ever do this? You get up in the morning, you just lay in bed and scroll on your phone, and then you just, like, eat crap for breakfast. That's going to snowball into a bad day. You just don't feel like you've accomplished anything, and you're an hour in, into your day. And so the first thing is that I tell our girls, is I want you to accomplish something. If you get up and you attack the morning, it's going to set the tone for the rest of the day. And so we have this bed-making rule. And so... You know, when the girls wake up, they got to accomplish the first thing. Well, make the bed, and then hopefully that, that snowballs. I really believe they will be better. They will be stronger because of this rule. Often, though, what happens is I have to tell them to go make their bed, and I get this, oh, like, Dad's honest about making the bed. He's always honest about making the bed. Dad is so lame. I don't have this rule for my sake. I have this rule for theirs so that they can feel accomplished in the morning so they can start the day off well and hopefully that will lead to success. That's our dad's approach is what John is saying. He says, I, God doesn't have these rules for himself. God's not up there saying, now, I have this rule so that you don't have wild sex. I don't want to see any of that. He says, no, I have this rule so that you can achieve better, fuller intimacy. I'm not standing up here saying, I, I, I have this rule so I can squash any shopping sprees. I don't want to see you see any, I don't need shopping sprees. No, God is saying, I have this rule so that you can experience financial peace. I don't have these rules to make myself look better. I have these rules so that you will overcome the world. This is how you navigate this crazy place. I'm giving you a trellis for your life. And if you neglect the trellis, it will keep you from being the person that ultimately you want to be. Because who you want to be, deep down, who you want to be is up the trellis. One of my favorite songs is uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. I love that song. I'm an old soul. I like hymns. Yeah, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus is, is so good. It was written by Helen Lemmel. She wrote the song. She actually attended uh, Moody Bible Institute here in Chicago. I wonder if she ran into the public safety officers too. <laughs> but she, penned the, she penned the words to, to this song. And, and one of my favorite lines in, in this song is, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I love, love that line. Because to me, it's such a refreshing thought. You ever find yourself wishing to care less about the politics of this world? Gosh, I just wish I cared less about this stuff. Wish I cared less about all this social media stuff. Wish I cared less about this rat race. Wish I cared less about who's who and who's with who and who's friends with who. 
Ever find yourself just thinking, I just wish I cared less about this all? Well, what you're really wanting is for the things of earth to grow strangely dim. It happens on the trellis. It happens inside God's precepts. That as you grow and as you gain strength, spiritual strength, mental strength, you get stronger, you get better, you're going in the right direction, your head is more clear, your home feels healthier, you have this sense of direction because you have the trellis, you've got a trellis. And after a while, if you lean into the trellis, you find yourself living above the weeds, living above the craze of this world transcending the chaos and competition and misery further and further and further above it all and closer and closer to the light of his glory and grace. That doesn't come through just trying to obey everything or managing the rules. It comes from leaning into the relationship, embracing the trellis, loving the precepts, And as John says in verse four, man, enjoying the ride on the way up. So where are you at with all this? Where are you at? How are you doing with God's trellis? When you look at God's trellis for your life that he's given you, is there a part of the trellis that you're ignoring? Have you just been trying to manage everything? Or has law something that you just try to pick and choose? Not something you lean into. In fact, maybe you even struggle to believe that the person that you really want to be is up on top of the trellis. You struggle to believe that. And I totally get it. As I said earlier, my, my, my struggle with this sermon was just like, okay, what do we do? I guess the application is follow the rules. <laughs> I guess it's the application. But you boil it down, boil it down to what I asked earlier. There is something that God is asking you to do and you haven't been doing it and you know what it is. And it came to mind. God has given you this trellis for your life and there's a portion of this trellis where you say, I just can't do that, can't do that. Maybe it's leading and you're not doing it. It might be loving that person. It might be giving. It might be serving. It might be making church a priority. It might be going somewhere. Maybe it's confessing something. It's sacrificing something. But there's something, there's a part of the trellis that God has placed in your life and you're just really struggling with that portion. And you're neglecting it, trying to manage it. What is it for you? It's really our reflection moment. I'm going to just give us just a little bit of time here before God in quietness. That question, what is it for you? Which part of the trellis? What what is that thing that God has been asking you to do? Maybe it's a, a name that comes to mind. Maybe it's a face that comes to mind. Maybe it's a situation, but there's something that God has been bringing you to, leading you to, and it is a trellis. You're going to be better by following God in that area, but you've been neglecting it, what is it for you? I think we all got something. So let's take this time to confess that and commit to it. I'll close this in just a second, but this time is yours.
So here's the thing. I, I, I think Helen Lemmel and John, I think they had it right. All of this boils down to verse one, or as Helen would say, boils down to first turning your eyes onto the relationship onto Jesus. I mean, you can go, you can go do that thing, and, and you should. I hope you do. But are we really going to love what God is calling us to? Are we really going to lean in to the life that that God wants us to live? Are we really going to do that without first turning our eyes upon Jesus? Because Jesus is our inspiration of a life lived on the trellis. He is our relationship before the rules. He's our motivation to even do it. See, the reason that God is calling you to do that thing is because Jesus did it. Our inspiration, our motivation, our big brother. And so before we go do that thing, we're going to leave, we're going to go do that thing. But our hearts first and foremost need to be reminded of Jesus and to really turn our eyes upon Jesus as we go do that. And so Brian's going to sing this song over us, that song we talked about earlier. He's just going to sing it over us. And, uh, and again, we take this time to commit. Okay, God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Just for now, just listen. If you want to close your eyes and just kind of sweetly listen to this. So your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace Want to sing that with me? Just from right where you're sitting. Come on, sing. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Will you stand? Come on, stand like you're going to sing this song and it's going to change your life right now. Come on. Putting all in perspective that Junior talked about tonight, your trellis. Come on, one last time. Sing, turn, you guys sing. Father, that's ultimately what we want, what we crave, uh, what you would say what we need. It's for the things of earth, the misery, the, the confusion, the chaos, the sin that so easily entangles to grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. God, we thank you so much for the trellis that you've put into our life. We corporately confess that so often we lean away from it and we ignore it. But God, we do thank you for it. And may your Holy Spirit push us to lean more into what you've asked of us and for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.